Are you seeking fulfillment for your life? Do you want freedom from fear? That's why we're here. Welcome to Jesus 101, introducing you to the real Jesus. And now, here's your host, Elizabeth Talbot. Welcome to Jesus 101. I am Elizabeth Talbot, and I am so glad that you have joined us for this new series. I want to tell you how it's going to work so that you know. If you have joined us in the internet, these are eight and a half minute segments. So every day you get eight and a half minutes, and please join us on your way to work or on the gym or at home. Every day you can download one eight and a half minute segment, or you can go back and forth in the segments that are already there. Now, if you're joining us on TV, you'll get three of these segments in a row for a whole topic. So I am hoping that you will join us regularly, whether it's on TV or on the internet. And if you happen to have a Bible, or a paper, and a pen handy, please do that too, because we're going to just go deeply into the scriptures, and I think you're really going to enjoy this. Our program is called Jesus 101 because we are going to see the Bible from Genesis to Revelation through Jesus Christ. These are our lenses, per se. And so it's not just the Gospels. It's the whole Bible, even though we're going to start at the Gospels. Today, we're going to start with the Synoptic Gospels. The Synoptic Gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. A good way to remember that strange word is same optic, same view because Matthew, Mark, and Luke are very similar. The Gospel of John is very different. And we are going to use a method called redaction um, analysis, which is, comes from a German word, redactor, which means editor in English, because each one of the Gospel writers actually edited the information for their audiences. They're like preaching a sermon for a particular audience. So we get three portraits of one Jesus, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We're going to see the uniqueness of each one of them today. And we are going to start with Matthew. Now, maybe this is the version of the gospel that you're needing today because you're going through something. So let me tell you what Matthew says about Jesus. You're going to love this. So get your paper ready, your pen, and your Bible. And we're going to start on Matthew chapter 1. The first thing you get on Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, is the record of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David. See, the first thing that we're told is that this is the Davidic king we've been waiting for since the beginning. As you know, there are many prophecies about the coming Messiah. Matthew is placed first in the New Testament, mainly because he, he makes the most direct connection with the Old Testament. He will quote the Old Testament more than 42 times, out of which 12 of those times are called prophetic formulas, which means that, that he actually says it to fulfill what the prophet has said. So he divides the genealogy of Jesus in 14, 14, 14. And he says so in verse 17 of chapter 1. He says there are 14 generations, 14 generations, 14 generations. He actually has a theological point when he says that. Because the name of David, you know, Hebrew um, has value for the consonants. So DVD is 464. And then number is 14. So he just wants to make sure you get it from all angles that Jesus is in fact the son of David. So this is a very triumphant, triumphant gospel. Everything Jesus is in control of, and he is acting like a king. Now, it is no surprise then that the way that he tells of, the, uh, of, of Jesus' uh, death, actually, is triumphant. I mean, for Matthew, the cross is actually a victory. So why don't you come with me to chapter 27 of Matthew and see the uniqueness of the, go the gospel, how it actually tells this story, which is really amazing. Let's go to chapter 27 of Matthew, verse 50. Shall we? Okay. Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. See, Matthew always shows God's intervention so strongly. He is the only one that records this earthquake. And then he says something that no other gospel writer says. Verse 52. The tombs were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep, were raised. 
And then he realizes that maybe he rushed a bit because this is Friday night, Jesus is dying and he's already telling of the resurrection. Do you know why he's doing that? Because in the Old Testament, there were expectations that when the Messiah came, well, many people would be raised from the dead. You can read this in Daniel chapter 12 and in many other places that they expected a resurrection. So here he says, in the moment Jesus dies, really, it's a victory, it's not a defeat because all these people are raised from the dead. And then he realizes he got ahead of time a bit. And he says on 53, and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. This is a triumphant gospel. Jesus is in control. Jesus is the Messiah. He is the king, the Davidic king that was to come. And check this out. This is so awesome. The way that he tells of the resurrection, it, he has a, a little detail that no other gospel writer has. Chapter 28, verse 1 and 2. Follow me. After the Sabbath, as he began to dawn towards the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat on it. Oh, the sitting on it. Can you imagine the angel rolling away the stone of death and sitting on it? This has been the type of language we get throughout the gospel. Throne, authority, kingly language. And here we have an angel that rolls away the stone and sits on it. Oh, maybe this is the version of the gospel that you need to hear today because you're facing something that feels like a tomb and you want to make sure God is in charge of that. And actually the whole gospel ends with this very authoritative statement from Jesus, not recording in any other gospel. Verse 18 of chapter 28, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, says Jesus. Isn't that awesome? If you're facing a difficulty, oh, we need Matthew's version of the gospel. We call this the crown version of the gospel, the kingly version that says, well, Jesus really is in control of everything because he purchased at the cross the right to bless us that way with, with the control and authority in heaven and on earth. And this we're going to call Matthew's version. We're going to call it the crown version, the kingly version, the one that says, no matter what you're facing, remember, not only all these people were raised from the dead when Jesus was crucified, but the angel rolled away the stone and sat on it. You know, Matthew has what we call an inclusio. An inclusio is an academic word for sandwich, really, narrative sandwich, which means that Matthew will start and end the gospel in the same note. Check this out. He calls Jesus Emmanuel on the first chapter. He's the only one that records that Jesus was, in fact, Emmanuel, God with us. And he ends his gospel by saying, I am with you every day until the end of the age. Can you believe it? This is Matthew's Jesus that he wants to present to you. One that is constantly present in whatever you're going through and that is a Davidic king and that is in control and that resurrected the dead when he, when he died and that has authority on heaven and on earth. And he sent an angel who rolled away the stone and he sat on it and he's sitting on the problem that you're facing. Now, that's Matthew's version of the gospel and perhaps is the one that you need to walk away with today because it's the one that you are really needing to hear. Now, I can't wait to tell you, Luke has a very special, special message for us too. You're watching Jesus 101. Welcome to Jesus 101. This is the crown version of the gospel that we have already shared in the previous segment. As you know, we are in this new series, Jesus 101, and you can watch us in the internet every day in segments of eight and a half minutes, or if you're watching us in TV, you'll see these are three segments put together in one topic. So I'm so glad you're back with us. And now we are going to go to Luke's version of the gospel. I am so excited about Luke's version. Of all the versions, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, of the synoptic gospels, remember? Same optic that we have already seen before. Well, Luke is the most radical as far as grace is concerned. He has 
segments that no other gospel writer has. Like, for example, the prodigal son, which you have heard of, I'm sure, in Luke chapter 15, when there is a man that squanders his life and comes back and the father just embraces him. And then we have a real life story that is very similar to the prodigal son, which the thief on the cross, that at the last minute of his life comes back and says, I want to be part of your kingdom. And even though it's an outrageous request, the most outrageous thing is the answer. Sure, you'll be with me in paradise. So he has a lot of very radical things so that everybody knows that they are included in the kingdom of God. He is so into you knowing that you're included that he writes his gospel this way. A man and a woman, a man and a woman, a man and a woman. The whole gospel is written this way. And he wants women to know that they're also included. Go look. <laughs> That's awesome. He also wants you to know that even if you're an outcast, you're included in God's grace. So he puts the story of a Jew and an outcast, a Jew and an outcast. Isn't that awesome? And remember Matthew, how he starts the genealogy of Jesus name dropping for the Jews, David, Abraham in the first verse. Well, Luke traces the genealogy of Jesus all the way to Adam in Luke chapter three. So if you're a descendant of Adam, well, you're included in God's grace. Oh, that's wonderful. I can't wait to tell you what Luke records and no other gospel writer records. So now we're gonna to go to the Bible. And again, if you have paper and pen at home, Please write some of these things down so you can share with other people. I love sharing this time with you. Let's go to Luke chapter 24. There is no other gospel writer that records this journey. You know, Luke is really into journeys. So there's a lot of times where you find people in journeys in the gospel of Luke. Uh, he's the one that records in the, in the book of Acts, which is Luke's second volume, that the first Christians were called on the way. <laughs> he really has these journeys of perception. And this is one of them, Luke chapter 24. We have two disciples that they are not understanding what's happening. And they are on the way from Jerusalem to Emmaus from verse 13 of chapter 24 on. And they were talking, verse 14, with each other about all these things which had taken place while they were talking and discussing. Jesus himself approached them and began traveling with them, but their eyes were prevented from seeing him. And they tell him their story, how sad they are, how frustrated, how final this weekend felt to them. I, I, I love their, their statement here in verse 21, where it says, we were hoping have you ever had that problem in your life that you say, we were hoping this was going to be it. I was hoping this was the husband. I was hoping this was the job. I was just hoping. And they were saying, we were hoping he was the one going to redeem Israel. And you know what Jesus does at that moment? He gives them a theology class. Oh, I absolutely love this chapter because it gives us the way to interpret scripture. And Jesus says to them, uh, verse 26, was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? And then verse 27, oh, I would pay a million dollars to have been there in that class. Then beginning with Moses, all the books of Moses are the Torah. I brought a Torah. This is an actual Torah. It's the first five books of the Bible written in Hebrew. It's so beautiful. And he took the Torah and said, see, said Jesus, all the law of Moses and all the prophets. He took them and he says, it says here, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. He says to them, remember the law? Remember the prophets? Well, they were about me. And, and, and he says it again to the rest of the disciples. We're going to have a whole program on this very chapter later on. But, but he says it to the rest of the disciples because no one was understanding. They knew their scriptures, but they didn't understand it was all about Jesus. So verse 44, he appears to the rest of the disciples. These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. These are... Um, 
the whole formula, the three divisions of the Old Testament is the whole formula. The law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms, said Jesus, it was all about me. Then he opened up their minds so that they could understand scriptures. The word understand is a really interesting verb in Greek that could be translated, he gave them the ability to connect the dots. So that, because they already knew the scripture, they just had not understood that the whole thing was about Jesus. The scriptures, of course, for them were the Jewish scriptures, the Old Testament that we call it. Now, you're going to say, well, how does that relate to me? Well, first of all, it says this, that there was a plan of salvation from the very, very beginning, that Jesus' death was not an accident, that all the prophets, all the Psalms, all, everything in the Jewish scriptures really was pointing to the cross, that this cross was not just an accident, that somebody got upset with Jesus. And maybe this is the version of the gospel that you're needing today because you're not knowing how this whole thing fits in your life. You're kind of wondering, is there a plan for my life? Or is this all an accident, what's happening to me? So maybe you're needing the gospel of Luke today that says, look, salvation was not an accident. All the law, the prophets and the Psalms were talking about him. And for sure, your life is not an accident either. There is a master plan. So maybe that's what you're needing to hear today. You know what happens with the gospel of Luke? Well, there is also an inclusion. Remember we talked about the inclusion being a sandwich, a narrative sandwich, where the gospel starts in one way and ends in the same way. Luke has a wonderful inclusion. The angels come and tell the shepherds in chapter two that they have news of great joy. This great word in Greek is mega. So they have news of mega joy, not just joy, mega joy. And you know how, how it ends? Once the disciples understood that there was a, a master plan in the last two verses of the gospel, and they, after worshiping with him, returned to Jerusalem with mega joy. That is Luke's version of the gospel. Maybe you need Matthew's that we already seen. The one that says the angel rolled away the stone and sat on it, the crown version. Or maybe you need the master plan version that once you realize that even though you don't understand the plan, really there is one and you're filled with mega, mega joy. Even if you don't fully understand the plan yet. Or maybe like myself, you need Mark's version of the gospel. Well, I can't wait to tell you Mark's version. You're watching Jesus 101. Welcome back to Jesus 101. I am so glad you joined us again. We are having, I am having a great time with the Synoptic Gospels and I assume you are too. Well, we have already seen Matthew's version of the gospel the very kingly, authoritative Jesus that is always in control and ends saying that all authority has been given to him on heaven and on earth. And remember on resurrection morning, the angel rolled away the stone and sat on it. Well, maybe that's the version of the gospel you're needing that reminds you that God is actually in control of what you're going through. And then we went through Luke's version of the gospel. Well, Luke is the one that reminds you there is a master plan and there is a master plan for salvation. And Jesus on Luke 24 says, remember, remember, it was all about me. The law, the prophets and the Psalms were about me. And maybe this is the version you need because it reminds you that there's also a master plan for your life, that you fit in somewhere, that all the things that are going on somewhere along the line will fit. Maybe we'll have to wait till eternity to know exactly how they fit. But it's comforting to know that there is a master plan. One of my favorite sayings when I was going through a hard time was, I don't know the master plan, but I know the master planned it and I'm included. Well, today we're going to do the gospel of Mark. This gospel is the one that I constantly need. This version of the gospel is the one that I constantly need to remember. Now, let's study. Get your papers and your pens at home. If you are there and want to study with us, aside from looking at us, watching us, <laughs> this time you can actually join us one more time. 
The Gospel of Mark is the only gospel that calls his book a gospel. So let's go to it, chapter 1, verse 1 of Mark. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As you know, gospel means good news. Where do we get the word gospel in English? Huh? Well, it's from the old English, God spell, good news. And then we dropped a couple of letters and that's how we ended up with gospel. The Greek word is euangelion. In Spanish, evangelio is almost identical. That's where we get the evangelist in English, euangelion. And he starts by saying of verse one of chapter one, the beginning of the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God. You know, there is um, the thought that is still, I think, consensus in scholarship, that Mark is actually the first gospel written. And I know some people will defer because, you know, we're constantly studying this. But the gospel of Mark is the shortest of all gospels and uh, has the most primitive Greek per se. It's almost like he just put a few things together. It wasn't his uh, own language. He writes in a, in a very difficult way, like he's just learning, like I used to write English when I just learned it. And um, he is the one that we believe was actually traveling with Peter and that he actually got Peter's version of the gospel, that Peter told him the gospel of Mark. John Mark in the book of Acts is constantly with, with Peter. Now, this would make a lot of sense really because this gospel shows Peter in the worst light possible. <laughs> it's almost like the other gospels that, you know, we can't do this to Peter. We're not going to really tell everything about Peter. But Mark just goes for it. I mean, constantly Peter is with his foot in his mouth. I mean, constantly saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. You know, the gospel of Mark concentrates in Jesus' suffering because it's written to a suffering church. Many people think that it was written during persecution in Rome. And uh, half of the gospel concentrates in the last week of Jesus' life. From chapter 8, verse 31 on, we get this passion predictions. Passion meaning the death of Christ. Constantly Jesus predicting and on the way to Jerusalem to be killed. Now, as I was telling you, Peter is constantly out of place with what he's saying. And I'm going to take you to, to Mark chapter 14. This is when Jesus makes a covenant with them. And we call this communion or the Lord's Supper. Verse 22, while they were eating, he took some bread and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to them and said, take it, this is my body. And then he tells them the blood of the covenant. Verse 24, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I say to you, I will never again drink of the fruit of vine until the day when I drink it anew. Now, this is very interesting because of what comes next. Jesus just made a covenant. He said, this is the blood of the covenant. But then he says, verse 27, you will all fall away because it is written, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. What kind of a God is this that makes a covenant with people that he already knows are going to fail him? I mean, when I made a covenant with my husband, I am certainly hoping that he will keep it when he said he will be only with me. This God makes a covenant with failing people. And Peter says, no, not me. Maybe all those disciples over there need that type of a covenant. But Jesus, I'm never going to betray you. Never, never. I am really worthy of being your disciple. Well, he keeps insisting on this. You can read verse 30 and 31. Unfortunately, the chapter is not even over when Peter betrays Jesus terribly. Three times he denies him. And you can read this on verse 66 to 72. Just as Jesus said he would, he betrays him. He's not worthy of being his disciple. And actually, no one is in this gospel. They never get Jesus. They're dense. They don't understand what he's saying. But let me tell you why this is a version of the gospel that I always need. It's because of the resurrection account in the gospel of John, uh, in the gospel of Mark. Chapter 16, verse 2. Very early on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. 
And entering the tomb and going to verse 5, they saw a young man sitting at the right, wearing a white robe, and they were amazed. And he said to them, do not be amazed. You're looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who has been crucified. He has written. He's not here. Before, he is the place, here's the place where they laid him. And then he says something that no other gospel writer says. But go, tell his disciples, and Peter. It's right there. Read it in your Bibles. And Peter. Oh, he mentions him by name. If it wasn't for those two words, none of us would stand a chance of being Jesus' disciple and having the assurance of our salvation through what he has done. But I can imagine Jesus coming out and saying, don't forget to tell Peter because he's not going to show up. He's not going to go to Galilee. I call this the name tag gospel. I'm going to write my name here, Elizabeth. And I tell you, I know that that morning when Jesus was raised, he told the angel, don't forget to tell the disciples, and Elizabeth, and Peter. I know he called me by name, and, and I know he called you by name. And if you have failed him miserably, perhaps you need to remember that on that morning, on resurrection morning, he called your name. I'm going to put you here. Join me in saying the words of Isaiah, the prophet. God tells me, I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Isn't it amazing that we are His and that on that morning, He called us by name? <laughs> 